Go All ahead. right. Here we are for another weekly lecture. This lecture is specifically about treating anxiety. Um, now, going through our past lectures, there was a real formal kind of approach to it. We tried to get a lot into the science of everything. Um, and I'm just going to go off with some emails that I've been given and take a little bit more of a casual standpoint. Um, I want you to be able to watch this video and treat the issue. Um, if you're new to anxiety, if you have been recently diagnosed or maybe you've self-diagnosed, um, this is a lecture that you want to watch um, and this is a lecture that will give you a lot of answers. Um, so just to start off, um, anxiety is not caused by some form of weakness. Uh, anxiety is a mix of environmental and genetic factors. Um, and, and we know that stress, at least according to all of our studies, in the long term um, causes chemical imbalances, it causes changes and damage to the amygdala's functions, this being part of the brain that controls memory and mood. Um, so one of the things that you may face as someone who's suffering from anxiety and seeking treatment is a lot of people just telling you that you know, it's all in your head, you can get over it at any time, um, and that's really just not the case. Uh, anxiety is something that needs to be taken serious, um, and if you go at it as something that needs to be taken serious, but something that can be taken care of, uh, you're going to do a lot better. Um, so, you know, if, if you want to get more into what the causes of anxiety are, I definitely recommend you watch our previous lecture. Um, I'm tr going to try and not touch too much on that, um, just kind of as needed. So, as a preface to this lecture, I wanted to go over a couple things that people generally look at um, when they're, you know, feeling as if they may have anxiety or they've been recently diagnosed by, you know, a, a practitioner or maybe, you know, a friend who's had it. Um, so these are some things that I think you should look out for and kind of avoid. Whenever somebody tells me that they found a cure or a permanent treatment for anxiety, um, no, matter, no matter how well-hearted that may seem, that's something that you should immediately avoid. There is no such thing as a cure for anxiety disorders. Um, anybody who tells you that they found a cure, anybody who tells you that they did something, it was really simple, and now all of a sudden you know, they have no issues, um, there's two things there. Um, they probably didn't have an anxiety disorder. Maybe they were just a little bit stressed, and they did something that had a psychosomatic effect. And now, you know, they're no longer really worried about something um, or they're trying to sell you. Um, it's usually someone trying to sell something, trying to sell an idea, trying to sell, you know, an ebook or some type of, um, you know, alternative medication. It's just as simple as that. There's no immediate cure for anxiety um, and there's no easy way to go about it. Uh, just like you wouldn't you know, go into a diet that says, you know, you can do nothing all day and all of a sudden you'll lose this weight and you'll look like some type of model. Uh, it's the same thing here. Anxiety does not work that way. It's something that needs to be controlled, not cured, and it's going to require complete life change. Um, on a similar note, I also tend to avoid recommending anything that's dubbed a natural cure. Um, most naturals, which is usually a blanket term for an herbal treatment or an herbal medication um, are poorly researched and usually the research shows that they're a little more effective than a placebo. Um, and that's pretty much saying that you know when this when these things do work for people, it really is all in their head. You know, they really wanted this to work, they really believed this was going to work. And so it did work. Um, it was, as we'll go over later in the in the lecture, the mindset of getting past anxiety the, the idea that you're going to get better is extremely important and it doesn't really matter what quality treatment you get into uh, if you have a negative mindset you're just not going to get past it um, so you know somebody who's running with this really positive mindset and who's really all about taking these natural supplements and medications it may work for them but it's almost entirely entirely the placebo effect um, and one strong example is John's wart I, you know, I hear a lot of people recommend John's Wort, or they ask me if I recommend John's Wort to other people. I do not recommend John's Wort. Um, you know, and, and the idea behind some of these natural medications is that they're safer or they're healthier. Um, sometimes they're less expensive, um, and for most of that, that's completely wrong. Uh, John's Wort, if anybody has ever taken it, is is pretty expensive. 
Um, it's not a cheaper alternative, not in most cases anyways, and the, the ability to get medications these days, the, the government aids, the state and local aids, um, and even aids on the side of the manufacturer, they, they often pass out coupons, um, <clears throat> because let's be serious, they're going to recoup that money anyways. Um, you know, that, this makes medications extremely, extremely cheap. Um, so in comparison to John's War, it's much more expensive. As far as health issues go, um, John's War specifically, there's risks of psychosis, there's risks of uh, suicide, increased depression, there's the physiological reactions like nausea, vomiting, you know, dizziness, blurred vision, um, really all of the same symptoms that you're going to get from taking any other medication um, those kind of symptoms that often scare people away from taking, say, an SSRI, they're the same types of side effects that you see in something like John's Wart. They're just often not reported by people who take things like John's Wart because, you know, they're in that mindset. Um, I, I seldom come across people who, you know, they were all about Western medicine and all of a sudden, you know, they tried John's Wart and they've changed their mind. It's usually somebody who comes from an alternative medicine background who takes an interest in something like John's Wart and then they'll swear by those kinds of herbal medications. Again, a lot of the time it's psychosomatic. Um, this isn't something that we show by saying, uh, or we prove by saying, you know, well, we have more people who said this. It's not really a hear-tell type of thing. It's really a matter of study, research, MRIs, uh, really going in and seeing how the brain reacts to these different types of medications. We know that these natural medications typically don't have a strong effect. Um, so yeah, it's not really, it's not safer. It's not really any healthier. Um, it's definitely not uh, cheaper, and so I, I just don't recommend them. Um, some studies have shown, um, as far as John's Ward goes, that John's Ward is only slightly more effective than the placebo. Other more modern research uh, shows that it's probably not even that. Um, so you know, in, in some cases, the placebo working. You can say that for a lot of the artificial medications as well. Like I said, a lot of it has to do within the mind, but you're not getting anything safer by going the natural or the herbal treatment route. So I like to get that out of the way. Um, now, so before we get specifically into the actual treatment, I want to go over some things that are really common uh, issues that come up when you're trying to treat anxiety and anxiety-related disorders. Um, the most common one that I run into, um, and, and this is really, it's digging a hole. Uh, is the financial issue. Um, and so a lot of people see these financial issues as being this big deterrent, you know, this immovable immovable issue, um, you know, that this idea, you know, I don't have the money for it right now, I can't pay to see a therapist, I can't afford to take medications, and so, you know, I'm just, I'll, I'll deal with that later. Um, that just, it doesn't work from, from any type of rationale. That does not work. The longer you prolong treatment, the starting of treatment, the worse it's going to get. Um, and, and that's worse from every standpoint. If you look at it from an emotional standpoint, you're going to get worse. You're going to, to suffer more issues with depression because anxiety is synonymous with depression. If you're anxious, you're going to be depressed if you're anxious. Um, you know, and again, some of the factors like the social issues that end up getting caught in the anxiety, um, it's going to make you depressed. So emotionally, the longer you go without starting treatment, the worse that gets. Uh, physically, you know, you, you deteriorate, you gain weight, you lose weight, uh, you, you know, you start to build up um, too much unhealthy cholesterol, or you sometimes even suffer from too low cholesterol. Uh, the physical issues related to anxiety can be extreme. Um, and you just really don't want to go through that because as much as you destroy the physiological issues, you're going to have to make up for it later. Um, and you don't want to end up paying, you know, even more in medical bills because you let your body deteriorate. Um, socially, you know, it, it's really common for someone to take up a social anxiety or maybe panic disorder with agoraphobia and they cut out their social group altogether. Um, I mean, you're, you're really going to pay for it. You're losing a lot of support, which is fundamental to getting better. Um, you know, you're, you're losing out on going out and really living life. Um, you don't want to pay for it there either. And then back to the actual financial issue, um, you're, you're going to end up paying even more because you're going to be in treatment for a lot longer. Not only reversing the damage you've caused by preventing treatment, but then getting back to the initial issue. Um, so the longer you delay this, the more it's going to cost you. 
Um, I can't say enough how much it's worth it to, to not only you know go completely broke trying to get treatment going, but even going into debt to get treatment done because you're going to end up paying even more in the long run. Uh, even if you plan on getting financial assistance through the government or through a family friend, it's worth it to start now and to dip into a little bit of debt than to wait on the financial assistance to come in. Uh, the way that a financial aid from the government tends to work is that you're going to get back pay, which is going to be a really big payment from the day you filed until the day you actually start to get your monthly payments. Um, sometimes I've heard of that being as low as like you know like a thousand to you know a thousand five hundred. Sometimes I've heard of it as high as being four or five thousand. Um, there can be an unforetold amount of gap between your payments um, from the time you start up and sign all your papers to the time it actually starts paying you, and you're going to make all of that money back. So it's really worth it to go into debt. You're just going to end up having the money to cover it in the long run. Um, so definitely go for that. Um, and again, just to really cement that in, you're going to pay in so many more ways, including financially, if you decide to just forego any form of treatment because you think it's going to be too expensive or because it is too expensive. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Treating anxiety is expensive. It's terribly expensive. And that's one of the reasons why anxiety gaming does what it does because this type of treatment should not be expensive. This type of treatment should be available to everyone. If a good portion of the world is suffering from anxiety-related issues, that, that's an epidemic that needs to be treated, and it shouldn't cost you an arm and a leg to get past this. So and we will do what we can um, as far as getting people financial assistance. So if you're watching this right now, and you're thinking to yourself, you know, well, maybe you're right, but I, I really don't have the funds. You know, just contact us and we'll do what we can to get you the funds. Um, we're really good at doing that. We've gotten it for several people and it, it can really be you know, life changing just getting that initial funding. Um, but like I said, don't delay it. Don't wait for us to get you started. Just go into it. Um, the other common issue that tends to come up is a matter of staying in treatment um, <clears throat> and then that initial starting of treatment. Um, and really this comes to people, you know, they, they stay in treatment and then they start to feel better. And so then they quit treatment um, or they, you know, they're in treatment and it's really tough and they decide to drop out or going back to the starting treatment, you know, there's a lot of anxiety related to starting the initial treatment. Um, let's say you have a social anxiety or maybe you have panic disorder with agoraphobia, you know, this kind of fear of leaving a safe place, usually your home. Um, that initial step to seeing the therapist or physician is really tough. Um, it, it's terrifying. There's so much fear. You know, they're going to judge me. They're going to make fun of me. They're not going to take me seriously. <clears throat> they're going to, you know, they're going to write me off. They won't hear me out. Um, there's a lot of different types of fears that go into this um, when you're starting to seek treatment or when you're thinking about seeking treatment. And I can tell you from uh, a provider's point of view, um, as somebody who's even worked in um, some of the really, really big mental health hospitals, um, people come in and this is always that idea that's going on and it's completely not true. People work in this field for a reason. You go through a lot of years of training to work in this field and um, and I don't want to say you get used to seeing these things because they're always you know, very tough emotionally from the care provider point of view. Um, but you really do start to get a feel and an understanding. Um, you know, at least for me as somebody who suffered from anxiety issues, I, I can immediately um, understand what somebody may be going through. But you know, for other providers who haven't suffered from anxiety, you know, because of their experience, because of their extensive training, they do understand what you're going through. They do know what it feels like to be that stress. They have seen these issues before. They're going to take you seriously because this is a very serious issue. Um, and they're going to hear you out. They're going to hear everything you have to say. And they're going to provide the best level of care that they can. Um, this doesn't really differentiate between seeing a physician or seeing a psychologist or a social worker. Um, they're, they're all going to really treat you in a really warm and comforting way because they, they want to help you. They want to help you get better. They want to know everything that's going on because that's essential for them to make a diagnosis. 
Um, all of the details and things you may be worried about, these are things they actually do want to hear. They want you to take the time to explain them. Uh, and they'll even have you fill out paperwork to make sure it's as detailed as possible. So that initial fear, um, you know, it's always going to be there, but there's a little bit of reinforcement in what I've said. You know, it's it's a little unjustified. Um, the, the reality is so much is so much sweeter than what's going on in your mind. Um, and of course, if you're you know if you're watching this and, and that's where you are as far as you're know, getting treatment, you can always message us, and we work kind of like as a halfway, a, a half step towards getting into therapy. It, it's actually become a, a, almost a common practice for someone to schedule a phone call or a one-on-one -on -one video call with us. Um, you know, even as close to 15 minutes before they see their therapist, and you know, we kind of talk them, talk them down a little bit, get them set up, maybe stay on the phone with them until the second they open the door to see their therapist, just to make sure you're, you're there and you're comfortable and you're okay with doing this. We're more than happy to do that. Please feel welcome to do that. Um, so, you know, that, there's, there's that issue. Um, <clears throat> the, other, the other issue really being um, a staying in treatment. Now, the staying in treatment, like I said, there's two different reasons that there's a struggle to stay in treatment. There's, you know, all of a sudden you feel better, you want to leave, or this isn't working, so you, you want to leave. Um, when, when a treatment isn't working and you feel like you want to leave, um, sometimes there's valid reasons. Uh, if you're not connecting with a therapist, that's a valid reason to want to leave. Um, I'm going to go into this more when we, when we talk about getting um, psychotherapeutic treatment because finding a good therapist is extremely important. Um, but if at any time you're feeling uncomfortable with a therapist, you feel like they're not understanding you, you feel as if there's just no you know, subconscious connection. All right, I just don't like this, this guy or this girl or this guy or this woman. It just doesn't really work for me. Um, there's reason to leave. However, I always recommend that you find a new therapist before you move on. Kind of like how you wouldn't want to leave a job without finding a backup job. Um, you don't want to leave a therapist and then get caught in that lull between seeing another therapist and then end up really delaying care. If you don't like your therapist, you want to find a new one and transition smoothly. Um, it's really easy to end sessions with a therapist. You can, you know, you can flat out stop going or you can tell the therapist in a more formal matter, yeah, I just don't think it's working. It does happen. Uh, it's happened to me uh, where somebody says, you know, maybe you know, we're just not connecting in the right way, and so maybe I just you know, want to see or talk with somebody else, and that's totally fine. There, there's no offense really taken. It's just it, it's how it works. Some people connect, some people don't. Um, but you want to stay in that. Similarly with the medication, if medication is not working, you know, there's, there's kind of two things that go on there. Sometimes medication doesn't work for everyone. Medication is really unique in the way it works. Um, you know, some people may swear by a certain medication and it treats all of their issues. For another person, it treats none of their issues. Um, but on the other hand, medications can take time to kick in. Um, if you're on something like a long-term SSRI or an SNRI, um, these can take you know weeks to months to really take full effect, and so you want to let them sit in your bloodstream. As always, though, with both of these issues, you want to talk with your care provider and communicate, and really you know get these issues felt out so that you're not quitting something ahead of time. And if you're going to quit, you always want to have a backup plan. You don't want to just drop everything um, and get caught in that lull again, like I said. <clears throat> and uh, the other issue being. Uh, things start to get better, and all of a sudden, you're you feel like you can leave treatment. This happens to be something that I see the most as far as relapse issues. Um, you know, I may be working with somebody, and we make a lot of progress as far as their anxiety goes, and then I don't hear from them for weeks or months, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'll get a, a message from them, and they've relapsed. Um, you know, and, and they don't understand, and they say to me, you know, oh, well, you know, what happened? You know, I was feeling really good, and then all of a sudden, I'm having panic attacks again. Um, you know, like I said, there's no cure, uh, and it's not easy. Um, treating anxiety is a life-changing issue. It's a life-changing matter. Uh, your diet, your exercise, um, you know, your, your daily regimens of everything, everything you do, is going to have to change a little bit to deal with the anxiety. Now, now, that's not to scare you and say, you know, I'm going to, you know, live my whole life as, you know, this deprived. Not at all. 
really living an anxiety free life and living the lifestyle that's required to be anxiety is actually living the, the lifestyle that so many people try to live anyways um, staying in shape and eating right and you know meditating or really reflecting on life uh, being emotionally open and talking with other people really making deep connections loving yourself and being honest with yourself these are all things that people try really hard to do um, and they don't put the pieces together um, and really this is what therapy uh, is going to teach you how to do anyway so you know living this anxiety style life is worth it um, and I say all of this, uh, this these life changes because even if the anxiety starts to feel like it's going away you know you take medications and you don't feel any of the anxiety symptoms anymore or you've been in therapy for you know a month or two and you've learned some tools to deal with that initial you know the panic attack comes on you're able to ground yourself and the panic attack goes away that does not mean you're done um, because if you don't learn the lifelong tools what's going to happen is you're going to face that same stimuli that triggered the anxiety to begin with and you're going to face it all over again you've really got to sit down with your therapist and learn how to deal with these issues one-on-one -on -one. You know, without some of the, the uh, relaxation tools to just kind of sit and be with that anxiety and learn how to face it. Because when it comes up, you know, in a couple months, you're not going to think of how to recover from a panic attack immediately. You're going to immediately go into, is this a panic attack or is this the real deal? Is something really happening to me? And if you don't have those long-term tools, it's going to happen all over again. You're not going to believe yourself. You're not going to trust yourself. You're not going to have that self-love, that self-trust, and you're going to snowball. Um, and that's that's really, really scary stuff. So always stay in treatment until the care provider sees that you know you're you're ready to go. You know, there are rare, very, very rare issues where you know a therapist wants you to stay for a while because maybe they're making money off of you. I, you know, I really don't ever see that happen. I hear about it happen from time to time. Um, but I really doubt that's ever going to be the case. And, you know, if you've been in therapy for years and nothing's working, then obviously there's something going on there. Uh, so try and stay in therapy as long as you can, as long as you are told to stay in therapy. And then, you know, allow yourself to be released from therapy by the provider because they're the ones that are going to know better than you're going to know uh, when you're ready. So let's get into the actual uh, starting of treatment. Um, and like I said, I want to do this, you know, from the point of view like just speaking to you telling you what to do if you're starting to feel anxious um, so the first thing you should do if you know you feel like you're anxious or maybe you've been diagnosed unofficially um, is you want to see your primary care doctor um, and if you don't have one try and find a walk-in clinic or a walk-in doctor's office and get an evaluation there um, now, something that usually comes up is is that people with anxiety feel like they may have an actual, uh, um, like, uh, not an actual serious, because anxiety is serious, but, you know, in their mind, they're thinking something dramatically more serious. It, it's got to be maybe a hepatitis, or it's got to be um, something that I'm dying from. I've got severe heart issues, and this is something that will eventually kill me. Um, and, you know, and, and that's common. The anxiety is, is trying to scare you. It's trying to get you to take it seriously. Um, and so th these are the thoughts that are going to go through your mind. In reality, um, what you want to do when you go to see your physician to make sure that you take care of yourself both mentally and physically, you're going to want to ask your doctor to check you for um, hypothyroidism. Um, and I, you know, I suggest this because the symptoms are very similar to anxiety and depression. Um, in some cases, uh, it's been seen to be about 25% of the diagnosed cases were actually hypothyroidism. Um, now, uh, you know, those numbers are questionable, but I do encourage you to check them out. Uh, it's not so much a serious issue. It's very much treatable. Uh, it's even naturally treatable, you know, without any medications. Usually you're giving medications because then it's treated almost immediately. Um, but you're, you're going to look into that. You may ask to get your heart checked out, you know, a very uh, nice physical, thorough physical. You're going to want to get a blood test. You may even want to get a small allergy panel to make sure you're not taking in foods that you know provoke allergies or an intolerance. Um, you'll see a lot of people swear by allergy-proof diets or what they call anxiety diets. A lot of these are really fad things, um, or you know, kind of wishful thinking that maybe it's just something that simple and I can let it go. Uh, not the case, but these are some of the things that you may ask your doctor to check, and that'll get a lot of the fear out of your mind, and that'll get everything covered. Um, so, you know, getting those, those things ruled out, um, 
this is really smart because your physician is generally going to um, give you a recommendation to see a therapist or a psychiatrist and they'll almost always give you a prescription to medications. Um, now, essentially the entire healing process can start and end right here if it's done early enough. Uh, early enough. That, that is to say, if you're feeling anxious right now, if you feel like you may be somebody who's suffering from an anxiety disorder, if you go and see your physician tomorrow, he gives you medication, he gives you a recommendation to a therapist, you get your blood tests done, you get all of your, you know, these different tests done, you're more than likely going to recover from this in a month or two, or maybe a couple weeks, and that'll that'll be it. Um, and, and, you know, I wish it was that easy, but it really is those starting issues that prevent people from getting into this. Um, it, it's really that issue of neglecting, seeking help when it first starts, that really makes it you know, get to the extreme levels that we typically treat and see on a regular basis. But if, like I said, if you're feeling it right now, it's starting, just do it. Go to the physician, contact us, we'll find somebody to treat you in your local area, we'll help you get funding, we'll give you the, you know, we'll help you build up the courage to see that, you know, that initial appointment, but it can really all start and end right there. Um, like I said, the longer you prolong this, the harder it's going to get. Um, so that said, you know, let's, let's cover the medications and how they're used to treat anxiety. Um, if you've watched your past lectures, and for the sake of the time, um, I recommend you do. Uh, I explain a lot about how the medications work um, from a biological standpoint, how exactly what happens inside the brain when you take these, uh, the different classifications. Um, we went through all of the, the new school and even some of the old school. I'm just going to cover really the basics, the things that you're going to hear if you're getting treatment right now. Um, and so if you're going to see your physician, he's probably going to drop a bunch of these fancy names like Paxil, Prozac, Zoloft, or Celexa. Um, these are all SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And uh, what these do is they tell the receiving neuron, there's this communication here, this, this brain chemicals. Um, um, and it, it pretty much tells the receiving neuron to take in more serotonin. And this is based off of the idea that um, you don't have enough serotonin that's going on in the brain and uh, you're trying to rebalance this or increase this and then that, that's shown to have worked and it continuously shows to work. SSRIs are probably one of the, the more standard uh, medications you used in all anxiety related issues and even depression. Um, and so you, you're more than likely hear some of those or even be prescribed some of those. Um, you may also hear something like Buspar. Um, this is a, more of a specialty type medication. This Buspar is really recommended for general anxiety. Um, however, um, even though it's very good for general anxiety disorder, uh, anxiety disorders typically happen to have this co comorbidity. Uh, that is to say, you know, you may have general anxiety as well as panic disorder. Uh, you may have panic disorder as well as um, maybe OCD or you know just just different types of anxiety-related disorders. You usually have several of them. And Buspar is not as good in treating some of the other issues. Um, and so you'll generally be recommended an SSRI or um, an SNRI. Um, and so similar to the SSRIs that I mentioned, there's those SNRIs that I kept bringing up. Um, and these are really good for treating a wide scope of anxiety disorders, especially someone who has general anxiety disorder and its comorbidity is shared with another anxiety disorder, they may get an SNRI like Cymbalta or Effexor. Um, and these work generally in the same way with the addition of the focus on a norepinephrine increase. Um, and you know, um, Cymbalta and Effexor, I mentioned those because uh, some of the other SNRIs really aren't ever brought up. But Cymbalta is very mainstream. You may have seen the commercials. And Effexor has been kind of a staple of the SNRI class. Um, all of these typically very safe, very well researched, very well understood, and they're used for the long-term treatment. That is to say several months worth of treatment. Um, and uh, when you take an SNRI or an SSRI, um, the effects aren't immediate. Uh, the effects can take somewhere between you know, a couple weeks to maybe a month or two. Um, and when these come in, the idea is not to completely eradicate the anxiety, rather to decrease the, the symptoms that exist with the anxiety. So, you know, let's say that, you know, you have general anxiety and you're often worrying about things and you're not really able to sleep because you're always worrying, you're always nervous, 
you know, you're off and on having anxiety attacks because of that worry. Um, taking an SNRI, <clears throat> once it starts to set in, you'll notice that you don't really worry as much, that you're not really thinking as much about some of the things that you thought about uh, as well. Because you're not really worrying so much, you're starting to sleep a lot better. And maybe the worrying's not completely gone, um, but you're really starting to feel a dramatic difference. Like I said, this can take you know several weeks to several months. That's generally how the medications work. Um, as we talked about in a previous lecture about the biology of some of these medications, uh, the idea isn't to take an SSRI or an SNRI forever or indefinitely. Um, and you know, I sometimes see that people, you know, have been taking these for years, I mean years, decades, um, <clears throat> or close to a decade. And this usually is the case with people who don't want to take uh, therapy, they don't have the time, or maybe they feel like they don't have the money to go into therapy, so they just want to sit on the medication because the treatment of the medication seems to be effective to the point where, you know, maybe they have a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of worry, but it's not enough to bother them. However, I always recommend that you, know, you only take them for the recommended several months use, at most up to a year if you really, really are struggling to get by. Um, and you always take these in conjunction with therapy. Um, still on the issue of medication, um, some of the, uh, the, the other side of the anxiety medications really um, are the really fast acting uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, we're talking things like Klonopin, Ativan, uh, Xanax, uh, most people have heard of things like Xanax. Um, these happen real, real quick, and the idea behind these drugs, even though you know they're, they're, they have different chemical makeup, um, is that they rapidly reduce the effects of anxiety and panic attacks. Um, and that is to say that if you, you, know, you show up at the emergency room because you're having a panic attack, what they're probably going to do is give you a low dose of Ativan, and you'll notice within 15 minutes that you're just you're done. You're you're completely out of it. You're not really feeling anxious. You're probably feeling a little bit embarrassed and, and confused. Um, you may even feel a little bit nauseous. But the whole point is that the anxiety is gone. You're not having this panic attack anymore. Um, and so you may be prescribed one of these, um, this colonopin, Ativan, or Xanax, or you know another generic form of these different benzodiazepines because they're going to help you pull out of those. Um, if you're treating a panic disorder, you know, especially a panic disorder with agoraphobia or something, you may be given Xanax alongside your SSRI. Uh, the point being that the SSRI is going to decrease these symptoms to help you get out of the house, to help you feel comfortable taking the initial steps out of the house and to go into your therapist. And as well, when you do have these panic attacks, you know, you just take the Xanax and real quickly the panic attack's gone, you're feeling good. Um, a lot of the times um, it, it goes either way, you're feeling really, really tired, but the panic attack's gone, so you're feeling better, or you're kind of feeling a little bit invigorated, you know, okay, cool, I beat this panic attack, like I can do this, and you're feeling a little bit more confident. Um, and, you know, I want to make a distinction here. Um, when people take Xanax recreationally, they, you know, they talk about feeling like Superman, feeling all high and mighty. That's really, really not the case when you actually have um, an issue that would require you to take Xanax. Um, even though I said, you know, you kind of feel a little bit more confident, it's not in the same sense that somebody who takes a recreational feels. Um, when you have anxiety-related issues and you take Xanax, you're typically just going to feel much more normal. Uh, you're not going to feel up. You're not going to feel invincible. You're not going to want to do crazy stuff. You're not going to, you know, freak out and, and feel, you know, invulnerable. It, it, it's, it doesn't really work like that. You're just going to feel better. You're going to feel a little bit more confident about what you're doing, but that's confidence in comparison to you, you know, 15 minutes ago, feeling as if you may die, feeling as if you may lose complete control of your life. So, so keep that keep that in mind. Um, and, and like I said, you're, you're usually going to get prescribed both of these depending on what the actual issue is. Um, some of the side effects of taking these medications are typically well known. Uh, there's the nausea, there's, you know, vomiting, um, there's stomach cramping, uh, headaches, dizziness, <clears throat> sometimes there's depression or an increased risk of suicide, um, you know, things like with Cymbalta, uh, it gets a lot of flack for some of those, those uh, depressive risks, but um, it's really just the nature of anxiety medications that they, they all work in different ways, um, you know, and while they may increase 
some activity, you know, that, that same activity could increase depression. So you want to take a lot of these side effects with a grain of salt. Um, most people who take anxiety medications, the, the big fear for them as far as side effects goes weight gain or weight loss. Um, the, sometimes the nausea, fatigue, some people, you know, feel really, really tired or they feel really, really awake and they sleep in, you know, weird habits. Um, but generally, you're, you might feel a little bit nauseous from time to time. At least, you know, for me personally, I think my biggest issue when I was taking medications is that I would feel kind of nauseous um, in the mornings. And that all changed up. I would just take my medications at night and I'd feel better. Um, it, it, all, it, it all varies for people. Um, so try not to get caught up on the side effects. There's no real serious issues that people worry about when it comes to taking these medications, especially if you only take them in the short term or like with the SSRIs in that mildly long term. Um, there's really no known heavy research done that suggests that these medications are going to cause any type of permanent or serious harm when taken at the recommended dose for the recommended lengths. <clears throat> now, before we get into the uh, therapeutic treatment, the actual therapies, I, I want to touch on some of the physiological things. Um, I guess not so much physiological, but, but really like the diet and exercise aspect of anxiety. Um, people really, really um, don't give these as much credit in their minds as they should be. Um, whenever somebody tells you to eat better, to sleep more, to exercise, um, you know, work out, you know, it's kind of in your mind like, duh, that, you know, that works for everything. I have anxiety, so um, I'm worried about it in a different light. Um, the reality is, is that it's no different here. Um, if you don't sleep well, if you don't eat well, if you don't exercise, if you don't take care of yourself physically, you're going to suffer from anxiety issues eventually. That's just how it works. If you already have issues with anxiety and you don't take care of yourself physically, it's going to be so much worse. It's going to be very hard to deal with. And the core part of getting treatment is really taking yourself, taking care of yourself physically. The medications are going to help. The therapy is going to give you the tools. But no matter how effective these things can be, if you're not dieting well, if you're eating junk food and you're not sleeping right, it's just not going to matter. The tools aren't going to sink, sink in. The medication's not going to work properly because you're going to keep imbalancing yourself. So making sure that you change up your diet to include things like omega-3 fatty acids, which have been shown empirically to help with anxiety, more specifically depression. Um, you know, if you keep eating processed foods, things that contain MSG, um, which is a known kind of food allergy for a lot of people, um, you know, obviously a very tiny one, but enough to kind of trigger anxiety-related stuff. Um, if you keep eating these kind of junks, it, it's just going to make things harder on you. So, like I said, before we get into therapy, you really, really want to get yourself in shape. You know, start off slow. Try and set an hour or two before you want to go to sleep. If your goal is to fall asleep by, you know, 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., you know, get ready for bed at 11 or 12. And, and just lay down. Turn off the TV. Let the computer go. Um, maybe read a book or you know listen to a little bit of music. I, you know, ideally go with the book and not the music. If you do go with music, go with something you know without lyrics, just instrumental, really calming, and just let yourself try and sleep. I've seen people make full turnarounds with their anxiety recovery solely by taking care of themselves physically. Um, and like I said, and I just want to reiterate that. If at any time you're doing good um, in, in your treatment, you know, as far as therapy and medication goes, and you drop the physical health, you're going to see some serious issues. Um, and, and it's happened to me personally, and I've seen it happen to plenty of people I work with. They stop sleeping well, you know, maybe they have a few nights where they stay way too late, or they just have too much coffee, and that's it. That's enough to cause a relapse. Um, and, and on that issue of coffee, no coffee, no alcohol. Um, Stop smoking cigarettes. Uh, don't use any form of recreational drug because all of these are known to increase anxiety-related behaviors. And I know some people, you know, they, they take mar um, marijuana because they think it helps them with their anxiety. For people who don't have anxiety disorders, that can sometimes be true. It can have a calming effect. However, for the majority of people who suffer from anxiety-related issues, marijuana does nothing but cause them to have panic attacks. So. 
you know, maybe just stay away from these things for now and see how it works. And I'm telling you, you're going to do a lot better if you start exercising. I'm going to do an entire new lecture specifically focused on the, um, the physical uh, health of somebody and how it really works with the anxiety. So stay tuned for that. Um, <clears throat> but now I'm going to kind of go a little bit since we're you know, only 20 minutes away from ending. I'm probably going to extend past that by 10 minutes to cover the full scope of therapy and, and how you want to handle getting into therapy. Um, therapy is uh, ther therapy is one of those those things that a lot of people are still apprehensive about. Um, it's easy to take a medication because nobody knows you're on medication. There's no stigma so much there. And, and because a lot of people are starting to take medications for even the slightest bit of stress. But seeing a therapist still holds this really, really heavy stigma of mental illness being a bad thing or meaning that you're uh, crazy or you know, just these terrible, terrible misunderstandings that people keep spreading. Um, seeing a therapist is probably one of the most rewarding things that you can do for yourself as somebody who has anxiety, someone who has depression, or somebody who doesn't have any of these issues whatsoever. Um, I know myself personally, developing as a man, um, you know, becoming the person I am, learning leadership skills, learning to you know, deal with my anxiety related issues, a lot of this stuff really, really helped and developed during times of therapy. Um, because in the therapeutic relationship, there's no fear. There, there's no, um, there's no bowing down to an authority. A, a good therapist doesn't doesn't lead you by being an authoritative figure. He leads you by being an equal, or he or she leads you by being an equal and really communicating to you as a person. Um, and this is someone you can tell everything to, and you don't have to worry about being embarrassed or upset. Um, this is somebody who's going to give you positive reinforcement, but really just ultimately be realistic with you at all times. Um, this is a relationship that you develop with an individual that can really set the standards for the relationships you want to create with other people. Um, and you know, if you get a good therapist, it's one of those relationships where even after you don't need the therapy as much, you want to kind of keep going back because this person's your friend. Um, and I, you know, I, you know, I keep in contact with uh, the people that I've con or I've met throughout the course of my own healing, um, because it it's just so important. It, it you know it, it can seem kind of strange because you're paying the therapist initially, and you know during the course of therapy, obviously you're paying them, you're compensating them for their you know their time in treating you. But it really doesn't feel like that with a good therapist, and you know and and even though that may be in the back of your mind at first, you you stop to think that because you really show up thinking you know, I'm here to talk with my friend. You know, and, and work out some of these issues. So, you know, I highly recommend seeing a therapist for all issues related to emotional distress, not exclusive to anxiety, because it's really going to help you grow emotionally and um, and help you develop. Uh, especially, you know, maybe if you had issues in your childhood, this is a great place to really develop emotionally. Um, that said, finding a therapist is always always something to take seriously. Um, now, for some people, um, you know, the, the, the person you want to see in therapy, um, their personality is really going to vary on different aspects. Um, and even their gender can make a difference for some people. Um, and, you know, I'll say this from a personal standpoint. Like, for me, uh, what I needed in a therapist was, was probably, um, you know, was a, a female therapist, somebody who could accommodate you know, uh, emotional outbursts and depression, and, and not let me not cause me to feel any type of intimidation. Obviously, no therapist is going to do this, or no good therapist is going to do this. Um, but your initial thoughts towards that therapist, you know, you may not give them time to open up and show that. And so, at least for my issue, a female therapist really, really worked well, or um, a male therapist who, um, you know, was very, very open emotionally, you know, up front. They don't have any type of intimidating aspects to them, and they're very open and accommodating of your emotions. That's really good for people who um, who find themselves having hidden sensitivities. Um, that is to say, you know, if you're somebody who finds yourself being outwardly intimidating as a, a means of self-defense, you know, whether it's emotionally or physically, if you find yourself feeling like intimidation is something that you use, um, you definitely want to see these types of therapists because you're you're going to let your guard down naturally. You're not going to feel the need to prove yourself to these people. You're going to open up. 
Um, now, on the other hand, if you you do find yourself as being kind of the other way, somebody who's very, very sensitive and very, very open, and you're kind of just looking to spill, uh, you may want to see somebody of your own gender um, because you're more than likely just going to feel comfortable opening up to that. As well as you may want to see somebody who's um, not, I don't want to say stiff, but who's not really going to let you flex all the way because a therapist allowing you to flex all the way if you're, you're kind of a little bit admittedly dramatic um, is going to let you escalate uh, uh, into really in, into your own anxiety. So you know, let's say that you, you kind of have this habit of manipulation um, or maybe you find yourself kind of lying sometimes and, and, and again you have to be you have to be really honest with yourself and with your therapist. You don't want to lie. This is the last person you want to lie to um, as far as getting help because lying to them is going to hurt you. And lying to yourself is, is something you really need to stop doing when you're looking at a therapist. Um, so, you know, being honest with yourself. If you feel like you do manipulate or sometimes lie um, to try and, you know, maybe convince other people of the seriousness of yourself or to take you serious or to give you respect, then you know, you want to find somebody that's not going to let you flex that all the way. Um, and what happens is if a, a therapist does allow you to kind of fully flex that, you're just going to end up lying to them and causing more problems for you. And then you're not going to want to admit to these lies, and you know, it's going to cause too much. You're going to end up a new therapist. So uh, be honest. Be honest with them. Be honest with yourself. Um, if it doesn't feel right, if, there's, if it's not the right atmosphere, if the lighting's wrong, the room's rearranged wrong, you know, be honest with yourself and be open to these things and admit to yourself whether this therapist is right or not. Um, don't settle. And as well, try not to get caught up in the walls. Like I said, if you're never seeing one therapist and maybe it's just not feeling right, find another therapist first before you leave and then just transition right away. Uh, you don't really want to mess with that and get caught up in that lull because too many people get caught up and then they don't find another therapist and things go downhill. Um, I want to bring up one form of therapy. Um, I'll just go over it real quickly. Personally, this is my favorite form of therapy, but it doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> this is humanistic therapy. This is um, initially uh, developed um, as client-centered therapy or person-centered therapy by Dr. Carl Rogers. And the idea really behind this therapy is that the, th the therapist is, is more a facilitator um, he's a he or she's a facilitator of emotional growth. They allow you to open up um, to the point that you know everything is just out there. Uh, there's nothing hidden anymore, and because everything is out there and in the open, you know you kind of feel this emotional pressure uh, release from you, and you know it's gone. You know these things. Uh, if if you look at it as a person as kind of like an iceberg, you know a lot of that iceberg is actually underwater. Um, kind of push all of this stuff up and now you know it's all above water you can see everything just seeing all of these things hearing all of these things things really really help to relieve a lot of stress and a lot of pressure and as well the whole time the therapist is really helping you reflect emotionally bringing up more and more so you may not have thought of a lot of the the, the initial things uh, you know you maybe just saw I was anxious and you know I, you know, I saw this or I felt this and I got anxious you know, humanistic therapy is really, really going to dig deep and try and bring about every single thing that could be a factor in this. All the things you may have overlooked and put it out there on the table. Um, and the idea really is, you know, this, this is going to help in that, um, according to Carl Rogers, you would essentially solve your own issues. Um, he believed that the power for change and the power for recovery was in, within everyone. Anybody could heal themselves. Anybody could change themselves. However, you know, we kind of, we don't know that. We don't know how to trust ourselves, how to love ourselves enough, how to analyze ourselves enough, how to go deep enough inside ourselves to bring about these things. And as well, we may be a little bit afraid to do a lot of these things. So training the therapist in the humanistic arts is really all about facilitating that emotional growth. And as he most famously says, you know, if I can become a person capable of fostering emotional growth, uh, this person will use the, or, the, the environment with which it's created, the person will use to ultimately solve their problems. Um, solve their problems, something along those lines. <clears throat> As you can tell, my voice is kind of going out a bit, but that's that's humanistic therapy, um, and this is really really good for people who feel like they have a lot to vent out, they have a lot to talk about. 
Uh, CBT and DBT are the other two forms of therapy we're going to go over, but they're very much to the point. They're very much changing the here and the now and going on. Uh, whereas humanistic therapy is really about changing, um, not so much changing the past. It doesn't believe you can change the past, but really dealing with some of these issues that are constantly in your current because of things that happened in the past. Uh, really focusing on helping you grow emotionally and the idea is that these things won't come back because you're stronger emotionally, because you understand yourself better. Because, you know, when you see something come up, you're, you're, you're not working on changing that thought. Rather, you understand why you would believe in that to begin with, and you feel strong enough to really just look past that. Uh, like I said, humanistic therapy is not for everyone. You know, it works for some people. There's really not a lot of solid research that shows it works for things like panic disorder and anxiety. However, like I said, depending on the type of person, it can be highly effective. And here at Anxiety Gaming, we actually use a, a hybrid therapy that is a mix between cognitive behavioral therapy and humanistic therapy. Um, you know, I do plan on going into that in, in depth at some point in a different lecture, but uh, the two work really well together. Um, and so with that, we'll kind of transition into CBT, um, which will really quickly just translate into DBT. Um, in, with CBT, this, this cognitive behavioral therapy, um, this is probably your go-to if you're trying to deal with panic disorder, with agoraphobia, or you're trying to deal with um, <clears throat> well, maybe uh, OCD, especially OCD. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy has an exposure aspect to it that is extremely, we're talking about 80% effective in treating OCD. Uh, OCD is really not going to be part of this lecture, but it's just an aside. Um, but CBT will probably be the standard if you go to see a therapist. And the idea behind the CBT um, is that we'll change the, the, the thoughts. We'll look for what's called a hot thought. Um, and this is the this this initial moment when you have a panic attack. You identify that hot thought that started that, and then you identify all of the thoughts around that. Um, and by identifying these things, you start to understand why you would be having an anxiety attack or a panic attack. You start to identify all the different triggers that are involved with that. And then what you want to do with the therapist is you break these things up into, you know, the, the rationality of them. Um, you know, so let's say you, you're having a panic attack and the, thought, thought, the hot thought is, I can't breathe. You know, that, that's what happened. You felt like you couldn't breathe, you know, going like this and your, your voice was starting to kind of go and you're starting to shake. The initial thought, I can't breathe. So we're going to identify that, and then we're going to go through, you know, how rational is this? How real is this? Could I breathe? Um, what are the proofs that I couldn't breathe? And so you'll write down, well, <clears throat> my voice hurt. It was hard to talk. My throat felt really dry. Um, you know, you go through and write whatever it felt, whatever rationale you had behind not being able to breathe. And then on the other side, you're going to go ahead and write down, you know, the, the logic against that. Okay, so... You know, what, what is the proof that I could, in fact, breathe? Well, I was able to talk. You know, I was able to walk around. You know, if I, if I couldn't breathe, there's no way I could walk around in circles telling myself I couldn't breathe. Um, you know, I'm still alive right now. You know, if I couldn't breathe, I, you know, I'd probably pass out. You know, you, you, you rationalize. You be realistic, not optimistic. Um, you know, you're just you're being rational about everything. And then you're going to go into a third column and kind of write down, you know, what's the reality of it all? You know, looking at both of these things, what's the truth? You know, you weigh the two together, and then you pick one. You weigh the two together, and then you pick one. You weigh the two together, and then you pick one. And that, that's the hot dog portion of it all, identifying some of those triggers. Another really strong aspect of CBT that is talked about a lot is these different aspects of, um, of how um, the anxiety really works. And that's, that starts off with this life-changing event or, you know, this, this initial stress-causing event. Um, and then it kind of branches off into, into thoughts, and moods, and behaviors, and then the, you know, the physical aspects of that. Um, and the idea is that these all tie in together. Um, and that if you change any one of these things, that they all change. That's what we call a positive correlation. So, you know, if you, let's say, let's... Um, you, you know, you're having panic attacks a lot, um, or you're suffering from general anxiety disorder, if you start to sleep better, the idea is that um, you'll start to eat better, 
um, your moods will be better, your thoughts will be better, and your behaviors will be better. So if you, uh, let's say we change the behavior instead, if we start hanging out with more people or being much more sociable, well, then the idea is that you're, you know, your thoughts are going to change as well. Your moods are going to be you know, much more positive. You're going to be happier hanging out with people. Um, and then the, the physical issues, you know, like sleep and eating, these are going to change as well for the positive. And so what a CBT therapist might do is ask you to focus on one of these aspects and really try and make small, very, very small increases there with the idea of kind of building up, building up over and over time and uh, kind of just defeating the issue like that. Um, as well with CBT, you might develop this hierarchy scale, especially if you're looking towards things like uh, agoraphobia. Um, you're going to develop this hierarchy that shows you know, the easiest things to face anxiety-wise versus the hardest things to face. So for example, um, if you have agoraphobia, let's say, um, um, you know, going into my kitchen and standing there for five minutes um, I think that that's about you know a 15 out of 100. It's doable. I'm going to be anxious because it's not my room. It's not my super super safe place within my safe place. But I think I can do that. So you may start there. Um, but on the other other end, you've got something like you know fly out to New York, like you know something. Whoa, you know that that's 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 definitely a 100. Maybe that's a 300 for you. You know, you're, you're going up this hierarchy, and you just start to make things on this hierarchy, and you and the therapist work together to try and knock these things out little by little, <clears throat> always with really, really small gains. There's no need to jump, you know, from a 15 to a 45 to, you know, an 80, and then you're done. And, you know, it's usually you're going to start with something really small, and then just go up, you know, just a couple numbers, you know, maybe like three or four at a time, and just slowly work your way through this hierarchy list. Um, this is important because it has a lot of reinforcing ideas behind it um, as well. You're setting for yourself long and short term goals, which is really, really important to the therapeutic mindset. Um, and so, you know, that, that's kind of the very basics of CBT. Uh, if you're thinking about getting into CBT, um, I, I highly, highly recommend the book Mind Over Mood, um, as well as the Anxiety and Phobia Workbook. Um, I'm, I'm losing who the Anxiety and Phobia Workbook is by. Um, perhaps it's Dr. David Burns. That, that's something somebody could check. Um, Mind Over Mood, though, this is by Dr. Uh, Greenberg and doc, Dr. Pat Sky. Um, and this is just a really, really good book. I always recommend this to anybody who's interested in doing CBT. Um, however, um, even though CBT is kind of like a, a really standard standardized treatment and there's workbooks, it's not something you want to do alone. You always try and do these things with therapists. Don't try and treat yourself. It's really just going to dramatically increase the recovery time, and you may not recover from it without the aid of a therapist. So don't don't bother risking that route. Um, <clears throat> lastly, we'll go into DBT. Um, DBT is is something that's become the standard overseas now. Um, you know, obviously, I've, you know, I'm in the U.S. You can probably tell from my accent. Or, lack thereof if you're in the US, I guess. Um, and DBT is this, this focus on mindful meditation. Um, it's the focus on the acceptance of this current moment and dealing with the anxiety as it comes in and just allowing it to kind of flow through. There's a lot of aspects of CBT that kind of you know, mix into DBT as far as facing this hierarchy, as far as understanding this connection between all of these different aspects. Um, but as well, you kind of, with DBT, you're going to go through um, a whole lot of different behaviors. I'm just closing the chat. Um, you're going to go through um, this whole process of understanding what it's like to just kind of sit and be with the anxiety, to fully focus on the environment around you. So. Uh, let's say you were going into a DBT session with your therapist. You know, the, the therapist was going to ask you to go ahead and get comfortable, to sit and feel relaxed. Um, and if you're anxious, the therapist is going to say, okay, so what you want to do is you kind of want to look around. You know, take, take in the environment, really focus on everything. Make note of everything around you um, and really start to keep that in mind. Now, now take note of how you feel, how your body feels, how your hands feel. You know, if you have any symptoms, point them out and make note of them and keep them in mind. You just kind of meditate on everything and really just a focus on being in that moment. 
Um, now, the kind of aside from the mindfulness, there's kind of a difference in thought as far as this goes. Now, the cognitive theories, re, cognitive therapy, is really about just changing that cognition, cognitive therapy, um, changing that initial hot thought, and, and really seeing a lot of um, of recovery because of that. Whereas this DBT is really more um, in tune to targeting these kind of um, this this inability to deal with the actual issue um, and building up almost a resilience, almost a tolerance for that issue, um, rather than kind of changing it. And in a way, um, it's really really focused on the behavioral aspect. And not that CBT isn't, because you know we did go through the behavior aspect of CBT um, and much more previously. But with DBT, you know, it's it's it it's more apparent the behavioral change uh, because you're watching yourself kind of in the moment change your response and in the future kind of just working on developing this behavior of not really being afraid because you're so in the moment. Um, so like I said, they, you know, they both work is focus on behavior changing, um, but it's so much more noticeable in the DBT it, as far as the, some, the person practicing it goes. Um, and so we work on things like distress tolerance, um, which you know, really helps control these impulses that come about um, when the anxiety initially hits, learning how to deal with that initial hit of anxiety, um, this emotional regu um, regulation, which is kind of like uh, you know, you're, you're going to deal with that pain of that emotion um, and, and kind of just set it aside. Uh, you, you see it, you allow it to come, you know, you have that initial fear and here it comes and now it's in the mind and you're afraid and you see it and you're afraid for a moment and then you just kind of let it keep going. It's like that, that regulation there. The mindfulness, like I said, being really, really in tune with the environment, your surroundings, and how you're feeling, and taking note of all of these things, um, and as well as kind of hitting a, a couple of spiritual notes where you kind of get in touch with yourself and you kind of learn and read yourself. Um, and this kind of comes from the fact that DBT and mindful meditation, um, this is really, really more of an Eastern uh, philosophy that's come in and just been kind of integrated into CBT. Um, and, and there's still a CBT DBT hybrids, um, but now DBT has started to become its own standalone. Um, and DBT, I highly recommend for people who are, you know, kind of really in the spiritual thing. Uh, you know, if you're religious, you're probably going to get a lot more out of DBT. However, that's not to say that DBT only works with people who are religious or have some type of spiritual mindset. Um, DBT, as far as the Americanized version of DBT. Um, or the westernized version, I should say, is very is it's secular. Um, there's no focus on any uh, specific deity, so to speak. It, it's really, really, um, I guess, westernized to deal with uh, the the meditation without a, any type of spiritual focus. However, people who take DBT, you know, they're able to kind of fix it into their own deity or their spiritual um, preferences and get a lot out of it from that standpoint. Um, and in DBT, there's some other plus sides in that you're going to learn to relax a little bit more. Uh, meditation does play a really nice part in dealing with things uh, anxiety related, especially general anxiety. I mean, when you're able to meditate, you can kind of go through and take inventory on your days. Uh, both DBT and CBT, as well as humanistic actually, will teach you how to inventory. Um, but with this practice of constantly being in a more meditative state, you definitely are going to keep that tool and practice it much more often with DBT. Um, and so, you know, this has kind of been a, a quick survey of treating anxiety. And really, if you kind of follow all of these things step by step, I um, mean, you take some of these warnings seriously, um, there's no reason why you wouldn't get past anxiety. Um, you know, taking care of your physical self, taking medications, getting into therapy and, you know, sticking with the therapy, it's foolproof. Um, like I said, there's no real cure. Um, there's always a possibility to relapse if you stop taking care of yourself, um, if you discontinue, um, you know, too early. Or, um, it, it, these are always going to be factors. However, the lifestyle of somebody who's dealing with anxiety and controls their anxiety is really, really positive. It's not a burden, so to speak. It, it's the ideal way that you know humans should be living their life, um, being much more emotionally available, being much more understanding of themselves and of other people. Um, you know, and that's one of the beautiful things about dealing with anxiety and overcoming anxiety. 
Um, you don't see somebody come overcome anxiety and become a worse person. That's never, ever the case. Like with most illnesses, anxiety is very humbling, um, and it causes people to usually become a lot better um, emotionally um, than, than they were previously. You know, and obviously if you understand what it's like to suffer from this emotional, this um, really serious pain, you know, you're going to be so much more in tune to other people and be able to help other people and deal with other people's issues. Um, you know, even if they don't have actual, you know, mental health disorders, so to speak, but more like a reactive depression or a reactive anxiety, you're going to be much more tolerant and understanding and much more nurturing of these issues because you face these things. Um, and so I'll probably end here kind of um, noting another thing um, when it comes to getting these types of treatments and these types of therapies um, is that, <clears throat> you know, again, it, it really all depends on how you want to take this. It really all depends on, on your ability and your desire to get better. Um, there's some core aspects of treatment that are always going to be throughout, um, and that's the will to get better. Um, the, the the support by family and friends, um, and there's the whole diet and health aspect of it all. Um, it's just, th these are all serious keys. If you don't believe in yourself, it's not going to happen. You have to believe in yourself. Um, and, you know, the, the really tough part is that, you know, if you're watching this right now and you've been suffering from anxiety for a while, you may have kind of alienated yourself. You may have cut across... Um, or, you know, maybe the, the friends you have left, they really don't understand why you, you know, you have anxiety or that you have anxiety at all. Um, but you need that support. You, you really do need that support to recover. You're always welcome to talk with Anxiety Gaming and you get your support here. Uh, the Anxiety Gaming Brotherhood exists really, um, as far as our gaming brotherhood exists, really to help with those things. The game with people who are also fighting anxiety, who are actively in treatment, on medications, getting better, who are working with us, working with others, um, and, and they know how to help you, or they can at least appreciate what you're going through, and they can provide that support aspect that's so fundamental. Um, and really, um, by getting this type of support, you're going to learn to be that support later on, and you're going to see that this is a really infectious circular activity. Um, this being a beacon of positivity, um, it's it just, you influence other people to be it as well, and it just, it spreads. So we keep a real positive environment for that support need. That's so very important. And again, um, the physical factor, so very important. Taking care of yourself, sleeping right, eating right, working out. Um, it's just, it's vital to getting better. Um, and I'll take the time now to announce something new that we're working on. It seems like we're busting out so many new things uh, faster than we can really handle, but this is something I'm really, really excited about um, is that we're right now working with a couple personal trainers to see if we can't get somebody willing to make some videos to focus really, really in-depth on the physical aspect, um, either with my help or with our other providers' helps, um, or on you know a solo thing where they can show you how to build a really good uh, diet plan to deal with anxiety. Um, that's specifically filled with things like omega-3s, that specifically goes around some of the more common triggers um, that can help you to find natural energy without coffee or energy drinks, which are disastrous to your mental health, um, as well as give you good workout plans that are low, uh, low impact, but, you know, solid cardio to keep you in shape and feeling better. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I hope you're looking forward to that. Um, again, I really hope that this lecture... Um, was positive and that this lecture taught you a lot of things and gave you a lot of help. Um, as always, we're, we're, we're available whenever, nearly 24-7 for people who do seek help. Um, and I very much encourage you to seek this help if you're watching this lecture right now. You know, even if you feel like you got a lot of your answers, just to message us and see, you know, if there's something we can't do or can't reassure you on. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and check over to see if we do have any uh, live questions. I know that we kind of exceeded this whole thing. Um, if one of my mods could link me to YouTube, I'll go ahead and check that right now. Um, but like I said, I know that we've kind of gone over a little bit as far as this, um, this lecture goes, so there's no questions. We'll just move right along to close. All right. 
So that's going to tie up the, this lecture. I thank you again for joining. Um, and stay tuned for the next lecture. We're going to go ahead and figure out something fancy for this next lecture and get it all set up. And we'll keep you updated if you're on the lecture mailing list.